Hi everyone, welcome back to part two of lecture nine where we're talking about um, family considerations and specifically understanding how to um, how a family deals with having an individual in their family um, that has an intellectual disability and how parents specifically deal with that and also siblings and just some important considerations to take into account. So picking off again talking more about impact of disability um, a lot of times you get questions about siblings. So well, how do other siblings do if they have a, um, a sibling, a brother or sister that has an intellectual disability? We know that siblings play multiple roles in the life of a child with intellectual disability. And this ranges from playmate to defender to antagonist and possible future caregiver. Um, again, really, this one's really important to consider. I think it makes it even more unique um, because Again, we know that most individuals with intellectual disability live with their families for much longer and possibly the duration of their lives than individuals without disabilities. And so oftentimes when they outlive their parents, which is usually what's supposed to happen, there's no one there to take care of them. This is something that's also really interesting and that the documentary Autism the Musical hits on um, in a very emotional way, but a very real way that's important to consider. We know that siblings can be positively or negatively impacted by these roles um, and they experience a variety of emotional responses to the, um, to the sibling with intellectual disability or the family member. But in general, all of the research is pretty conclusive that children without disabilities benefit from having a sibling with a disability. So you can just stop and think for a second why in a child without disabilities would benefit from having a sibling with disability. Um, when you stop and think about it, um, hopefully some things that come to your mind are really the emotional capacities that children without disabilities are able to develop and really learn from from a very young age because they'll have to see some things that might be really difficult and have to engage especially in these defender and um, type of roles and it really allows again the empathy building is really amazing um, from a very young age so um, in order to kind of highlight that I'm going to show you guys a YouTube video I'm going to warn you in advance that it is quite a tearjerker um, but I think it really does a nice job of highlighting how amazing and how much benefit a child a child without disabilities um, how much they can benefit from having a sibling with a disability. Okay. That doctor pretty much told us, you know, your son is going to be a burden on your family. Put him in a home. You've already got one kid, he's okay. This one has cerebral palsy, like he's gonna be a vegetable. He's gonna be in a wheelchair the rest of his life. He'll never leave your house. Put him in a home. When we found out we were having another little boy, they are so close in age. They were supposed to be biking and fishing together. But what Connor did for Caden, and that one little choice to do a race on a weekend, it changed them. It changed. My name's Carter, and my brother's name is Kaden, and we raced together in track once. For most young boys like Connor Long, the bonds of childhood are formed outdoors, playing together. But Connor's six-year-old brother Caden has been relegated to the sidelines for most of his life. Then an idea born out of a desire to connect with Caden. To become not just brothers or even playmates, but teammates competing together in triathlon. When I see him smiling and laughing, that means he's having a good time. And though they would finish last, they finished together. As well. He's really excited before the race. He stays up to like one or two in the morning. But after that, he falls asleep in the cart. This is our kitchen. We usually have this type of breakfast on the weekend. I cook on the egg. Yeah, they cook eggs and stuff. So they eat it right there. The one thing that makes me really mad is. When people walk down the road and say uh, the R word, if you know what that is, I just tell them that like, 
doesn't matter what he looks like on the outside, it's a matter what's on the inside. And he still has regular feelings like we do. And he understands what you say about him. If people could race with people that can't walk or talk or have any kind of autism, it might open eyes of people that don't really care about it. And maybe the people that don't care in the past will care in the future and actually do it with somebody. Ten years from now, the perfect place for me and Kaden would be, like, you know how people have the American flag on the moon? We'll have the Team World Brothers flag on the moon. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the winners of the 2012 Sports Illustrated Kids Sports Kid of the Year contest, joined by their parents, Connor and Caden Law. Hello, everybody. This is really awesome for me and Caden to do this because we've been waiting for a very long time. And a lot of people think that we would never be able to do something like this, but we can always do anything. Um, that, that, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for words. Connor and Caden are the real sportsmen of the years. They label it as sports kids. Nah, they're they're the real sportsmen of the year. That that story right there is um, it had if it didn't go off soon, it would have had me in tears. You guys are definitely coming down to Miami to see a game, to meet our team. You guys are unbelievable and what you do for your brother um, is unbelievable. I got two sons, eight and five. Um, so they will be seeing that story. Um, I don't have to preach anymore because what you do, I can just show that and my older son and know what he should do for his younger brother. All right, so I hope that really showed you guys that how much children without disabilities benefit from having a sibling with a disability. Um, it's always pretty amazing. And again, I don't, I know that that, um, that the sibling has a disability and some type of physical disability. Um, I'm not sure if he has an intellectual disability, but the take home is the, is what's really important. Um, the amount of emotional maturity and understanding and empathy and advocacy that that child has um, at such a young age to, you know, because of his brother is so, so important. So that's what I really want you guys to take away from sibling relationships when we're looking um, through a family systems theory and understanding the impact of disability. All right. So continuing looking at family functioning overall through family systems theory, it's important to understand that families define love and support differently. Um, and environmental and temporal, like what time and place an individual is at, those demands mediate the ways love and support are expressed. Or that, are, that are expressed. Um, again, in the documentary you guys will watch, um, there'll be some times where there'll be some less than, I guess, less than savory um, responses by some of the parents and sometimes they can be really striking but I want you just to think about the amount of stress and how people handle stress and how you know love is not always expressed by hugging and really being warm with your child having to advocate for your child um, and being really strong and pushing them um, to kind of get through difficult times that can also be love and supporting so I think it's important to consider that um, and how you know that families um, define love and support differently and it's expressed differently um, even cohesive families may experience temporary dysfunction in response to a crisis or a new situation um, that may arise from having a child with a disability so a new they find out 
um, about an additional complication or there's an additional barrier in their education or difficulties with getting support. Um, so even really cohesive families are certainly, you know, most likely going to experience some type of temporary setback. Family support groups have been shown to decrease perceived stress. And when we get into module three in the course, you're going to be exposed to a bunch of different websites for some very specific disorders that um, have and those populations have intellectual disability. And I always really encourage students to look at the family support sections and see how well that an organization does with their family support, what's the availability like, because it's really important um, for families to have some type of support group um, of other, you know, similar and similar families going through similar things. Um, additionally, when you look on the Autism Speaks website for this week, um, kind of look at that. How is the family support group stuff laid out? Is it adequate? Um, what does it do that's really good um, in helping families? So when you're looking at how a family interprets disability, it's um, it can be helpful sometimes to look um, through this grief model of acceptance when thinking about a family. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, sometimes the term grief can be a little bit off-putting, like, well, it's, why is the family grieving? Um, and the research supports that a lot of that families will kind of cycle through um, this process of grief when they first find out their child has a disability or they're going to have a child with a disability. And it's not necessarily for loss of the physical child, but maybe a loss um, of what they thought their child might or may not be able to do. And so um, it's really important to kind of consider where parents are kind of in this model. Um, and that can really help um, with, you know, when they're getting the diagnosis, um, when are they seeking treatment, um, when you're support planning, where are the parents? Because it's really important for clinicians or for anyone that works with families with disabilities to understand where they are and you know take a very non-judgmental approach so you can best meet the needs of the child and understand that the parents may just be going through some things right now and additionally this isn't stepwise in nature it can be cyclical a parent could you know have a child that's 15 and completely accept the disability and then they start worrying about college or life after high school and then they can kind of cycle back through some of these things and so again just because a parent has had a disability or you know has had a child um, with a disability for a while don't assume that they're automatically at this accept acceptance stage because you don't know what difficulties they're dealing with um, I'll kind of go through these things and kind of give you guys two examples that when I have been working with um, families before, um, it, this has been especially important to con, um, consider. So we're looking at the denial stage. This is, you know, the, I, nope, it's not true. My child is going to be fine. They don't have a disability. And then there's some depression. So some real sadness that once you're kind of like, okay, this is where they, we are. You know, the child's been born or the diagnosis has been there now. Um, and it can be um, upsetting for the parents. And then there's this stage of anger and guilt, so being really angry about it and feeling guilty. What if I did this? What if I didn't I do that? I should have known this or I should have done, known that. And then the bargaining stage, which is kind of, I promise I'll do this, that, and the other thing if my child doesn't have you know disability or if it goes away. And then lastly, acceptance, so fully accepting and embracing the disability. Um, Again, it's important to know that parents can be, again, in different stages at different piece, at different times and cycle back through. And additionally, be more accepting of certain parts of the disability as opposed to others. And so again, it's important to think about these things because if a parent is in an anger and guilt stage, um, the way that you approach them and support them and help them with support planning is going to be different than if they were at the acceptance stage or the denial stage. So um, I always like to tell a little bit about the first time I had to tell a parent that ha a parent that their child has an intellectual disability. Um, and it was a while ago. It was actually one of my first cases out of graduate school. And at that time point, I didn't have as much knowledge as I do now. Um, just through different experiences and teaching this class, I, you know, I've afforded a lot more knowledge. And 
I was really nervous too. It was really scary to tell a parent that they have a child with an intellectual disability. And in the state I was working, they also still used the term mental retardation, which was not going to make my job any easier. And I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And I didn't take any of this stuff into account because I was just so worried that I would get all the information correct. And certainly I tried to be really sensitive. But the parents, you know, it was devastating for them. No one had ever used those words before. Um, now I try to do a lot of prep work on the front end and I'm really transparent again with that assessment. Like this is what I'm looking for and this is why I'm looking at an intellectual disability. And so that can kind of help them move a little bit further down before they have to get those results. Um, but I didn't pay attention, you know, the parents didn't even know that was a possibility. And so it was very stressful for the parents and it's, I certainly could have handled it better. Additionally, a couple years ago, I was giving feedback to a parent. It was a reevaluation for a child that had Down syndrome and intellectual disability is part of having Down syndrome. So again, the level and severity is varies greatly, um, but we'll learn in module three about more about Down syndrome. But I assumed that the mother knew that um, having an intellectual disability was part of Down syndrome. So when I had to go over the cognitive and achievement results, I had to use the word intellectual disability and the mother started crying. And, you know, again, that's very, very common. And she was like, what do you mean? And I it had never been explained to her that having a child with Down syndrome was also meant that her child had an intellectual disability. And the reason why I had to use that term was because we were in a school situation and you have to have a primary handicapping condition or category of disability and their Down syndrome isn't a category or specific etiologies aren't necessarily always categories. So if the child has Down syndrome, they're most likely more times than not qualified under intellectual disability. So it's just so important to know where parents are um, and take time on the front end. So that way you can be most effective specifically with this support planning piece. And then again, really taking cultural variables and personal outlooks on disability and how that might influence certain parts of these stages or where parents may stay for a little bit longer or if they might move more quickly. Again, different cultures and um, individuals with different experiences or have more unique experiences or experience or non-experience with disability or maybe their religious views may impact how they think of disability. That can really affect where they are. And again, none of these are bad. I want to say that too. It's none of these are good or bad. It's not like the goal is acceptance. Let's just push them on through. It's important to just really um, appreciate where parents are, accept you as an individual that's working with a family um, that, with a child with disability, understand where they are and see what you can do to help them through. Again, because the ultimate goal is support planning to make things better for the child. So additionally, um, family challenges over the lifespan. Um, again, remember, cultural variables affect a family's willingness to plan. So some cultures are much more willing to plan for the future and how things will happen later on versus other cultures. So make sure you have a good understanding of how a family's culture um, and their background is going to really impact the ability to plan. And again, n nothing is bad or worse in that, in that case. It's important to plan appropriately, especially as individuals progress through the lifespan. But forcing a family to do something that's incongruent to their cultural beliefs or their religious beliefs um, is never going to be helpful. And it's not what's best for the family or the child. So just take, just making sure that you have a good understanding um, of um, cultural variables and you're taking them into account. Um, planning to transition responsibilities as primary caregivers age. So as an individual's, um, as parents, as parents age, um, they have to start thinking, who's going to take care of my child after I die? Um, I'm the one that has to take care of them into adulthood. What, what's going to happen when I'm no longer here? And then also making sure that um, families consider allowing the child with intellectual disability to experience adult roles and activities, whether this is dating, going to college, being in relationships, possible family planning, um, you know, sexual education. All of this stuff is often overlooked, and it's really important to consider how you can help a family allow their child to still experience adult roles and activities because they're adults.
um, regardless of um, their intellectual disability. So just some general family issues to remember that responding to a disability is highly individualized and there's not a one size fits all. And even though someone may handle something differently, um, understanding, like I always say, they're doing the best they can with the information, the skills, and where they're at in general with acceptance, and really just trying to be supportive and helpful. Um, the major detriment of the psychological health and well-being of a child with intellectual disability is the psychological health and well-being of the parents. So are the parents taking care of themselves? This is important when you start, we'll start looking at the Wyoming DD waiver and looking at respite care. Do the parents have a way for them to breathe and have some time to themselves. Um, foremost among the list of supports needed by families is a social support system that allows families to feel valued by others. So making sure that that is really um, taken into account and it's not overlooked. Collaboration among key members of the disability community can enhance family functioning. So such collaboration is determined in part by the congruency between the values and beliefs of the family and the support system to which it has access. The aging process of family members with and without intellectual disability drive decisions about the future. And then just one last kind of consideration, and we're gonna talk a lot more about this um, a little bit later in the semester, but specifically understanding parents' rights under IDEA or spe their special education rights, because a huge part of parenting stress can come from having to deal with special education. Um, if you talk to any parent or if you yourself are a parent that has a child with a disability, having to interact with school systems, especially initially, to get your child services can be very overwhelming and stressful. So I just like to remind parents of what their rights are. Um, and so you guys have a good understanding of what parents, even if you're not a parent, um, what their rights are. So they have a right to be included um, in an active actively included um, part of the individualized education um, program or IEP team. They need to be, um, provide consent to formal special education evaluation and assessment plan, so they have to agree. They have a right to access any educational records of the child once they've qualified and start receiving special services, special education. They can complain or disagree, so they have a right to due process about any matter relating to the identification evaluation or educational placement of their child. And it's really important then for the IEP team to go to, to come together and try to problem solve that is, so everyone's needs are getting met and feels like they're being heard. And they also have a right to appeal decisions about complaints that result in hearings with the local education agency, or you'll hear it referred to as the LEA, um, to the state education agency. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about um, parenting and parenting stress and the great things, you know, that having a child with a disability can bring to a family. Again, this is important background information um, for you guys to have when you go into watching the um, documentary. Thanks for your time and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.